Good evening, everyone. Uh, Salam Aleikum. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. Welcome to our uh, annual commemoration of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 73 years old, yet ever young, and ever needing our support and protection against the growing sinister forces in our country marshaled against rights for all. It's important as we gather to acknowledge that we do so on the traditional land of the Miami, Potawatomi, Shawnee, and Delaware tribes. And we pray that our, what we do here will honor their spirit and those present among us today. In addition to our distinguished participants tonight from the Muslim community, Christian clergy and community activists. We're especially delighted to welcome our keynote speaker, United States Congressman representing Indiana's 7th District, the Honorable Andre Carson. Representative Carson is a civil rights and human rights champion, as well as a champion of racial justice and the dignity of every human being and the planet itself. Just a couple of short notes about the program. Uh, afterwards, uh, join us uh, in the Folsom Room Fellowship Hall for some light refreshments and fellowship. And also, uh, Jan Everard is under the weather tonight. Linda Kerr will be reading the poem, I Am Proud to Be a Girl, from one of the uh, students at the School of Leadership Afghanistan. It's my pleasure to uh, uh, welcome to the pulpit Pastor Timothy Murphy, pastor, uh, senior pastor of Plymouth Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, for a word of welcome. Evening, everyone. Very pleased that Plymouth Congregational Church is able to host the Indian Center for Middle East Peace for this commemoration of the UN's Declaration of Human Rights. So just to share a word about Plymouth, we are so grateful to be able to host uh, this interfaith uh, gathering and this gathering around justice and human rights. That is part of Plymouth's DNA for the past 150 years, as many people know, but in case you don't, uh, Plymouth is a progressive Christian community that seeks uh, justice throughout our world. We have certain covenants that we affirm, being an open and affirming congregation to LGBTQ persons, family members, friends, neighbors, strangers, to be a safe and welcoming space where people can find a, a spiritual community for themselves and join with others. We are a just peace church because we recognize that justice can only exist when there's peace and there's no true peace without justice. And so we work for justice. We work to end oppression where no one is marginalized, left out, excluded, oppressed in our world. We're an earthwise congregation promoting those things that protect our planet for the next seven generations and beyond to care for the environment, to care against the ravages of climate change, and to promote those things here in this community and in our advocacy around the state and country. And last but not least, we're a global mission church, intensely local, intentionally global, partnering with neighbors around the street and around the world in the work of service and justice. So thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. And we're so honored to be able to host this gathering. And I hope it is a meaningful one for you all. Thank you. Dr. Smith. <clears throat> On January 6, 1941, President Franklin Roosevelt spoke before Congress, presenting a simple yet eloquent vision of a nation dedicated to what he called the four freedoms. Freedom of speech and expression, the best defense against the corruption of democracy, Freedom of worship, our shield against the forces of bigotry, intolerance, and fanaticism. Freedom from want, a commitment to erasing hunger, poverty, and pestilence from the earth. Freedom from fear, a freedom dependent on collective security with the creation of the United Nations. In 1946, Appointed as a delegate to the United Nations by Harry Truman after her husband's death, 
elected chair of the UN's Human Rights Commission and primary author of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Eleanor Roosevelt believed it hypocritical that Americans would commit themselves to fighting overseas for the four freedoms while not dealing with racial discrimination in the United States. She had committed her life advocating for equal rights for African Americans, women, and labor. For Eleanor Roosevelt, human rights meant civil rights, those fundamental rights to food and shelter and an education, as well as the right to vote. Because this was the 1940s, she had to first convince her own country that economic and social and cultural rights were included in universal human rights. Even after the Universal Declaration was passed, she had to debate with the American Bar Association and critics in the South that civil rights are human rights. None of this happened without a fight. That's my point. Even now, 73 years later, we're fighting the same fight. If there's a fundamental right to food, well, that means in the United States, the United States has a moral responsibility to feed every person. And if it's a fundamental right to be treated freely without discrimination, then what about voter suppression and other Jim Crow laws still present? And if there's a right to an education, then what about the government's commitment to free and equal, free and equal education for every child, every child, every child in America? Now, each religious faith will have their own understanding based in their own theologies. Tonight, we're highlighting Islam. But the Universal Declaration is what it says it is. It's universal. It understands the inherent dignity of every human being simply because of their humanity. So in addition to the Universal Declaration, I'm also mindful that on De December 4th, just a week ago, it was the 54th anniversary of Martin Luther King announcing the Poor People's Campaign. On November 29th, just a couple weeks ago, the United Nations also commemorated the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. The John Lewis Voting Rights Act, passed by the House of Representatives by a slim seven votes, failed in the Senate, so it still needs our advocacy. And today, over 80,000 Afghan refugees are being resettled around the country, 700 plus in Indiana and 75 in Fort Wayne. The work continues. Our work continues. <clears throat> Finally, a uh, point of personal privilege. Uh, as we gather here tonight, I'm remembering our dear, dear friend from the Muslim community, uh, J. Tamir Rashid, who recently passed away. Uh, Tamir was more than a friend, he, he was a brother a brother to me and a brother to many, uh, who was a pioneer in interreligious dialogue and the work for justice. Tamir and I met in 2001, shortly after 9-11, both of us point, appointed to the Tamir Richards Commission for Interfaith Understanding. Tamir was an ever-present representative of Islam at churches, here in this church, uh, community groups, book clubs, uh, and more and a partner in many cooperative interfaith ventures in our community, uh, including this particular service. Tamir participated in this, the first four or five different uh, UN commemorations uh, we held. In addition to many other honors, he was the 2013 recipient of Plymouth Church's Amistad Peace and Justice Award. So I guess I, I just, had to tell you that I'm thinking of Tamir tonight. Uh, I'm thinking of Tamir tonight. So friends, uh, uh, in this season when it's easy to be distracted by ephemeral things that don't last and don't matter, 
It's good, isn't it, uh, that we take, take some time to set our hearts and minds and spirits on the things of justice and human dignity, on the sustainability of the planet, and on our responsibility to and for uh, each other. Again, friends, uh, welcome uh, tonight. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Peace be upon all of you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is um, Abdullah al Haj. I am the Imam of the Islamic Center of Fort Wayne, and it is a pleasure being here tonight. Thank you for your invitation. Tonight, as we commemorate the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as a Muslim community, it translates through our own religious lens in the Universal Islamic Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted by the Islamic Council of Europe in September 1981. And then I will be you know, reading, reading a quote from that. Quote, human rights in Islam are firmly and rooted in the belief that God is the lawgiver and the source of all human rights. Due to their divine origin, no ruler or government, assembly or authority can curtail or violate in any way the human rights conferred by God, nor can they be surrendered. Human rights in Islam are an integral part of the overall Islamic order, and it is obligatory upon all Muslim government and organs of society to implement them in letter and spirit within the framework of that order. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is So Minu. I am with the Burmese Muslim community here in Fort Wayne. Uh, I will continue to uh, read after uh, Imam Abdullah. Uh, this right include the right to live, Human life is sacred and inviolable, and every effort shall be made to protect it. Whosoever kill a human being, it is as though has killed all mankind, and whoever saved a life, it is as though he has saved all life of mankind. Quran, chapter 5, verses 32. The right to freedom. Human beings are born free. Every individual and every people has the alienable right to freedom in all its form, physical, cultural, economic, and political, and shall be entitled to struggle by all available means against any infringement or abrogation of this right. The right to equality. All persons are equal before the law, and are entitled to equal the opportunities and protections of the law. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all. My name is Imam Hamza Sharif. I'm the Imam of the Universal Education Foundation. It's an honor to be here today, and it's always an honor to be in this church and blessing from God uh, that we have this church in our community and many other churches that are involved in the human rights activism. And also, it's a blessing to, to be with uh, uh, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. And it's a pleasure to have uh, our uh, representative, uh, Carson. Uh, I ask God to bless all of you. And thank you for the invitation tonight. I'm, I'm gonna continue reading from the um, declaration 
the right to justice. Every person has the right to be treated in accordance to the law and only in accordance to the law. Every person has not only the right, but also the obligation to protest against injustice. It is the right and duty of every person to defend the rights of any other person and the community in general. Every person has the right to food, shelter, clothing, education, and medical care consistent with the, with the resources of the community. This obligation of the community extends in particular to all individuals who cannot take care of themselves due to some temporary or permanent, permanent disability. And many other fundamental rights. The Holy Quran clearly described the purpose for which God created human beings, peoples, and tribes. O people, we created you from the same male and female and rendered you distinct peoples and tribes that you may recognize one another. Chapter 49, verse 13. Thank you. God bless. Good evening, I'm Peter Martin, pastor of Emmaus Road Mennonite Fellowship in Bern, Indiana. I'll be reading this evening uh, The Confession. It is a poem called Refugees by Brian Bilston. And I would draw your attention to the note in the program. The poem ev evokes the ways we see each other we see reality differently based on the way we position ourselves, the way we focus our intention and our gaze. So I will read through the poem twice from different directions. They have no need of our help, so do not tell me these haggard faces could belong to you or me. Should life have dealt a different hand, we need to see them for who they really are, chancers and scroungers, layabouts and loungers, with bombs up their sleeves, cutthroats and thieves. They are not welcome here. We should make them go back to where they come from. They cannot share our food, share our homes, share our countries. Instead, let us build a wall to keep them out. It is not okay to say, these are people just like us. A place should only belong to those who are born there. Do not be so stupid to think that the world can be looked at another way. Let us reposition ourselves, read from another direction. The world can be looked at another way. Do not be so stupid to think that a place should only belong to those who are born there. These are people just like us. It is not okay to say build a wall to keep them out. Instead, let us share our countries, share our homes, share our food. They cannot go back to where they come from. We should make them welcome here. They are not cutthroats and thieves with bombs up their sleeves layabouts and loungers, chancers and scroungers. We need to see them for who they really are. Should life have dealt a different hand, these haggard faces could belong to you or me. So do not tell me they have no need for our help. I do want to thank my good friend, Reverend Dr. Spath, for inviting me. What an honor it is for me to be with all of you uh, this evening. 
and Pastor Murphy and so many excellent folks that I've just had the opportunity to meet for the first time. Thank you so much to, uh, to have me in this hallowed hall. And if I may jo just go off script for one second, I do want to say uh, how much I am in enjoyed a meeting Congressman Andre Carson. And Congressman, I want you to know how much I adored your grandmother. I knew her when I was a young intern in the Indiana Senate many, many years ago and followed her career and how outstanding she was as a member of our House of Representatives, United States House of Representatives in Congress, and it was a pleasure. So thank you. It's nice to be here. Uh, we will be reading uh, some excerpts from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and I shall begin. Recognition of inherent dignity and of equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the wor world. And all of you would join in. Disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind and the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief and freedom from fear and want has been proclaimed at the highest aspiration of the common people. The peoples of the United Nations have in the Charter reaffirmed their faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and in the equal rights of men and women who have determined to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. It is essential that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, endowed with reason and conscience. Everyone is entitled to all rights and freedoms without distinction, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. No one shall be subjected to torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. All are equal before the law, entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest, detention, exile, or interference with their privacy, family, home, or correspondence, nor attacks upon their honor and reputation. Hello, everyone. I'm Caleb Yale with Fort Wayne for Refugees. I'm going to continue reading along here. Thank you for having me. Everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. Everyone has the right to leave any country, including their own, and to return. Men and women of age without limitation of race, nationality, or religion have the right to marry and are entitled to equal rights during marriage and at its dissolution. The family is the natural, fundamental unit of society and entitled to protection by society and the state. Everyone has the right to own property as well as in association with others. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, the freedom to change their religion or belief, and freedom of teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. Everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. Everyone has the right to equal access to public service. The people's will shall be the basis of the authority of government expressed in free elections with universal equal suffrage. Everyone has the right to the economic, social, and cultural rights indispensable for their dignity and the free development of their personality. Hello everyone, I'm Diane Rogers. I'm the president of the Oxford Street Association and I really stand for justice for my community and everyone in it. 
and thank you again for having me. Everyone has the right to free choice of employment, to just conditions of work, and the right to equal pay for equal work. Work. Everyone who works has the right for just remuneration for themselves and family. Everyone has the right to join trade unions for protection of their interests. Everyone has the right to rest, leisure, reasonable working hours, holiday pay. Everyone has the right to stand. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adapt, uh, equivalent for their health and well-being for family, food, clothing, housing, medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to secure in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, old age, and other circumstances beyond their control. Everyone has the right to education, full development of human personality, and the strength of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. These rights and freedoms should be promoted, understanding, uh, tolerated, tolerance and friendship amongst all nation and racial and religion groups. The right to participate in cultural life of the community, to enjoy arts and to share in significant benefits. Everyone has the duty to the community in which the field development of their personality is possible. Recognition of inherent dignity, equal and equal rights of all members of the human family is a fundamental for freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Good evening. I'm John Neubauer. I'm pastor of St. Mary Magdala Spiritual Center over on Ralston Street. This is a poem by Warson Shire, a British Somali poet, called Home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well your neighbors running faster than you. 
the boy you went to school with who kissed you so dizzy behind the old factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one would leave home unless home chased you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of, about doing. And so when you did, you carried the anthem under your breath, waiting until the airport toilet to tear up the passport and swallow, each mouthful of paper making it clear that you would not be going back. You have to understand no one puts their ch children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Who would choose to spend days and nights in the stomach of a truck unless the miles traveled meant something more than a journey? Linda and I will read two poems from Afghan girls at the School of Leadership, Afghanistan, Sola. Sola is the first and only boarding school for girls in Afghanistan, with 100 students in grades 6 to 12 from many different ethnic groups, Pashtun, Tajik, Hazara, Turkmen, Az, Lezbek, and many, many others. Um, they're selected from 27 of the 34 provinces of Afghanistan. Sola evacuated 250 students and staff in August of 2021. The school is operating <clears throat> from Rwanda. 50 of the students have been given scholarships to American boarding schools <laughs> beginning in January. Sola operates in an English immersion environment. Poetry is a favorite pastime of Afghans. I am proud to be a girl. Today is the day I tell myself I am proud to be a girl, a student and a defender for my people. I study in Afghanistan the country that the majority thinks is backward. As an educated girl, proudly I can say time has changed. They've changed mindsets. People started traveling and girls can take further steps. Strong girls like me have shown that the world is ours. Don't see me as useless. Don't push me away. Don't tell me that I can't because I am the girl that will change your negative thoughts. I am studying in a school with brave girls that are from all around Afghanistan. These girls are proud to save lives, teach, draw, fight, and we can bring equal treatment to everyone. Yes, we can do all the housework, but beside that, we can handle the heavy problems that come on us every time. Today, there is no discrimination and disability. We can mix up the cultures and we can rule the future. There is no way to stop this. You're still living. You have the ability. You're still the fighter for the equal future. And the girl with tears just don't know what she hears. A girl smiles because she always rises. In this world of dishonesty, a girl always tries. With all the problems and challenges, a girl still wants her rights. A girl changes a family, but I will change lives. Nothing can stop my mind because my dreams still fly. They push a girl back 
but that girl still fights. No one can quiet me. I still have my voice. My words show what I am. A girl from deep in her heart still writes. I'm Reverend Kimberly Cozan Flory, and I am one of many of the beautiful people out here, part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Tonight we are on the eve of waiting for something that will build back better. And it is time, it is past time. 35 million families are waiting, our children, need preschool education, we need health care, we need to build back better. And so these words from a year and a half ago, uh, a couple of years ago, are just as appropriate and timely as we wait and move and move forward together. From Dr. William Barber's sermon, we are in a struggle for the heart and soul of this nation for years to come. In a real sense, right now, we face a question. We are not the first ones, but it is our time to face it. In this moment, we in the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, believe we are in the midst and we must have in this nation a third reconstruction. We must find a way to make clear today that the moral and constitutional crisis we face in America is not just about Republican or Democrat, liberal or conservative. It is really about fundamental right against wrong. Fundamental humanity, who we will write off and who we will include. That's why we've come together, black and white, and brown and native and Asian, and gay and straight and young and old. People of faith like Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindu, people not of faith, but who believe in the moral arc of the universe. We must stand together and say, America's future depends on yet another revolution. As the Constitution says, we must alter this government and we must do it until living wages and guaranteed protections for the poor are not seen as simply a burning issue or any one candidate's issue, but as a moral issue. That expanding, that expanding voting rights and transitioning away from fossil fuels and guaranteeing labor rights and affordable housing and fair policies for immigrants, critiquing warmongers and equality and, and equality in education by guaranteeing every child receives a highly quali quality, well-funded, diverse public education and health care for everybody. Fairness in the criminal justice system and fighting the proliferation of guns and blocking the unholy alliance that the NRA has on our policy. That fighting for women's rights and LGBTQ plus rights and demanding that equal protection under the law is non-negotiable. There are, these are moral issues. This is what those who struggled before us fought for and died for. It's not new. It's just our time. And we have more than they had when they fought. So we ought to do better. So I want you to know that today when hands that once picked cotton join Latino hands and join progressive hands, that are white and join faith hands and join labor hands, 
They also join Asian hands and Native American hands, join poor hands and wealthy hands with a conscience, and join gay hands and straight hands, join trans hands, and join Christian hands and Jewish hands and Muslim hands and Buddhist hands. When we all get together, when the rejected joins, join hands together, we can turn this nation around. We can turn this nation and we can alter the course of history. You're invited to stand as you're able and join together as we sing, We Shall Overcome.
Good evening. I want to thank all of our friends who are here for uh, the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace's commemoration of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which we celebrate today. Uh, to the Professor and Dr. Mike, thank you, thank you. Uh, to Pastor Timothy Murphy, thank you. To Pastor Sarah and uh, Muslim imams and leaders and speakers and the Christian clergy, my friends, and the activists who are here. And our city councilor, Paddock, in the house. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Shalom. Salam alaikum, and praise the Lord, and pass the ammunition, the spiritual ammunition, the poetic ammunition, the humane ammunition. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King once said, and we all know, uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. You know, more than five decades after his tragic death, those words are more relevant now than ever. Though we have made progress in building his beloved community, we know that there's still so much more work that we should be doing strengthening human rights around the world has always been a guiding force for the advancement of the human race. You know, as one of your uh, proud representatives in Congress, um, a proud Muslim American, a proud Hoosier, a proud black American, and a fellow defender of human rights for all people, I want to discuss why the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is still as important and relevant today as it was when it was adopted nearly 75 years ago. As many of you already know, um, the UDHR was officially adopted by the UN General Assembly December 10th, 1948 motivated by the atrocities of two world wars. This declaration was the first time in human history that our global community of nations agreed on a comprehensive statement about our human rights. Since its proclamation, the UDHR has served as a global roadmap for freedom and equality. Of course, we know it outlines 30 fundamental human rights, detailing personal freedoms that belong to all of us, which no one should ever take away. And it recognizes that the inherent dignity of all members of the human family is the foundation for freedom, justice, and peace in this world. I think about tragedies that are impacting those of us who are passionate about these issues and people we love across the world. I think about Christians who are impacted, Jewish brothers who are impacted and sisters who are impacted, Hindus, Sikhs, non-believers, especially Muslims, fellow Muslims. China is an example. One of the, the world's largest superpowers, the People's Republic of China, has sought to restrict the practice of Islam throughout the country by persecuting millions of Uyghur Muslims for many years now. There are more than 10 million Muslims spread throughout the western region of China, 
And this religious minority has been persecuted by the Beijing central government, by those who seek to erase the Muslim identity from its borders. You know, inside many of these Chinese internment camps, many Uyghur Muslims have publicly stated that they have been forced to renounce Islam, they criticize basic practices, and even recite the Communist Party propaganda songs every day. Additionally, there are so many media outlets have reported that Muslims are being forced to eat pork and drink alcohol against their wishes, both uh, which are forbidden in Islam. But there are also widespread reports of torture, mass murders at the hands of the Chinese government. Now, authorities have shut down so many underground Christian churches and torn down crosses of some of these churches which have been deemed illegal by the government. Now this is wrong, plain and simple, we know. But America has a responsibility to lead the way in condemning and stopping this oppression. That's why this week the House passed legislation blocking the import of products that are made through the forced labor of Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities in internment camps. Now this bill passed nearly unanimously with only one of our colleagues voting no. No amount of money in the world will be more valuable than basic human rights. If you look at India, now even though India is the largest democracy in the world, we have still seen ethno-nationalist uh, folks in the current administration under Prime Minister Modi slowly unravel the secular and democratic fiber of Mahatma Gandhi's homeland. The Modi government has spent much of their administration trying to marginalize minorities inside of India, including Dalits, Christians, Muslims, just to name a few, by infringing on their basic human rights protected under UDHR that we're honoring tonight. Now, it's clear to me that these violent anti-Muslim attitudes within the Modi's political operation mirror the Islamophobia that we saw over a year ago under our buddy Donald Trump. I urge Americans to be just as engaged in ending anti-Muslim discrimination in India and across the world as we are here in the U.S. And many of you know recently my colleague, sister and friend Ilhan Omar has been targeted by many on the far right. Of course, many of us are targeted, but Congresswoman Boebert made a reference to her at a fundraiser, similar to the one we just left a few hours ago. Thank you. And she made a reference to her being a terrorist and carrying bombs in a backpack. That kind, of that kind of language to me is not only un-American, it's unacceptable to have a sitting member of Congress talk about one of her colleagues in a way that trivializes her existence and that minimizes her struggle and contribution to the greater society. So, we're at a crossroads of what must we do to set a precedent. Now, we could learn great lessons from our Jewish brothers and sisters. Great lessons. When they said never again, they meant it. And I think Muslims, because it's a new phenomenon in Congress, must take a similar approach. Look at the struggles of the black community civil rights movement, and we're still fighting 
against police brutality and institutional racism. But now you have a Muslim community that is multiracial and multicultural and dealing with a new reality, a post 9-11 reality. It's very clear. I can remember before 9-11, being a young man, going to the mosque, trying to register people to vote, and was met with some resistance. And then after 9-11, some of the same Muslims, Brother Imam, you know, who before 9-11, were legally white in terms of checking a box, but socially they were non-white, now began to re-examine who they were under this reality and started making references to the successes that had been made by the black community. Fighting for justice, fighting to be a part of the American project, fighting to escape terrorists back home, but now are faced with a new terror. And that has caused us to work together. And that's why this interfaith work is so critically important. Because allyship means that you have a network. It means that you have an army of support. It means that faith leaders can weigh in on their congregants and press them to adhere to the edicts that are contained in not only the Torah, the Talmud, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, the Hadith, the Gita, and say, let's stand on these principles. I look at the American spirit, the Hoosier spirit, and I think about the plight of Afghan refugees all over the world. And I'm reminded of our former first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, who once said that justice cannot be for one side alone, but most must be for both sides. What does that look like? According to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Afghan refugees constitute one of the largest protracted refugee situations in the world today. There are nearly six million Afghans who have been forcibly displaced from their homes. Of those, 3.5 million are displaced within Afghanistan, and 2.6 million are Afghan refugees living in other countries, including here in the U.S. We have all seen and heard the tragic stories of Afghan refugees struggling mightily to leave their country with their families intact. I believe our country was right to end our military intervention there. But we cannot turn our backs on the Afghan people, especially now, especially those who assisted our U.S. troops. We can't do it. Now, I firmly believe uh, that we have a moral responsibility as Americans to help our allies who bravely helped to rebuild Afghanistan. And now they are refugees seeking resettlement in places like Allen County and Fort Wayne, in places like Marion County and Indianapolis. I have a special affinity for Fort Wayne. Uh, not only do I remember coming up here as a, as a young child with my grandmother, but I can remember visiting friends here. And some of those friends are I grew up with or in law enforcement now, there are firefighters up here. And in my time as a law enforcement officer, I'll never forget the extension of Hoover, Hoosier hospitality that I feel and have felt in Fort Wayne and greater Allen County. One memory, uh, as a cop, there was a place called Pierre's. It was like 10 clubs in one place. <laughs> now, there was chaos in Pierre's, but there was fun there. But the Hoosier spirit was also there. 
and Hoosier hospitality. And that Hoosier hospitality must extend not only to Afghan brothers and sisters, not only to Uyghur Muslims, not only to South Asian brothers and sisters, but we have to have a laser focus on Palestinian brothers and sisters. We know that the black struggle continues in this country and we're gonna stay there. We know that the Latino struggle continues in this country and we'll stay there. We know that the indigenous struggle continues in this country and we're gonna stay there. But we have to deal with the Palestinian question who continue to fight oppression at the hands of the Israeli government. You know, we've been working hard in Congress to make sure our country holds Israel accountable for this wrongdoing. Now, let's be clear. I care deeply about the safety of the Israeli people, but we should not be giving Israel a blank check to fund their ongoing human rights violations against the Palestinian people. Now, as you can imagine, uh, I've taken some heat for my stance on this, but I was raised by my grandmother and I didn't come to Congress to be popular. I came to do what is right. Being critical of Israel doesn't make me a bigot. It doesn't make me anti-Semitic. I love the Jewish people. I'm intertwined with the Jewish spirit. I'm critical of my own country, America. I'm critical of African countries. I'm critical of Middle Eastern countries. I'm critical of South American countries. It doesn't make me a bigot. I want us to continue working hard to bring about peace to the region and to ensure the safety and security and equality of Israelis, of Palestinians, and all who call the region their home. Now, of course, this just isn't about folks of the Islamic faith. More than 75 years after the Holocaust, anti-Semitism remains a very dangerous and growing crisis throughout the world. I stand with my Jewish brothers and sisters and will continue working with them to end the discrimination and violence they face. But I also firmly support all of the Christians around the world who face persecution by observing their faith. You know, we have to safeguard the human rights of everyone, regardless of faith, even if they even don't have a faith. We have to ensure that people of faith don't use their religion to justify discrimination. Every single one of us has a moral obligation as Americans and as people of goodwill to speak up against injustice and oppression wherever we see it. That's why many of us in this room, myself included, work tirelessly to end Donald Trump's hateful Muslim ban. And that's why we speak out against Islamophobia and prejudice in any form in Congress, which is the People's House. You know, whether it's here in our state of Indiana or far away in places like China, India, Israel, or Palestine, we need to make sure that basic human rights are protected and everyone has adequate food, shelter, safety, education, and other basic necessities of life. I'm reminded about a discussion uh, that Jesus was having with his disciples, and they were talking about this notion of leadership. And Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, said, He who wishes to be chief amongst you shall first be your servant. 
What does it mean to be a servant? It means that you have to be a bit selfless. Not a pushover, but a bit selfless. To see a greater cause than oneself. To not be so wrapped up in material possessions that you become distracted with your ambition and can't see the plight of your neighbor. You become so distracted by your goal and your obsessions that you miss the mark and see that your loved one is suffering. To be a servant first means that you're the one folding up the chairs after the service. <laughs> that you're the one that's there serving food to the homeless. That we're the ones who are giving in charity for zakat and understanding the meaning of giving in charity. Understanding the symbolism and the substance behind fasting and what it means to withstand from worldly and day-to-day -day pleasures to connect us with the plight of the less fortunate. It means that the religious texts aren't just there for us to revere and recite, but we have to internalize the text even though we rest on feet of clay as imperfect human beings. Jesus left the example. Muhammad وسلم, left the example. Let us follow the example of our religious teachers and make the world a better place. Thank you for having me. I'm your congressman. I'm your friend. I'm your brother. I love you. Thank you. Friends, as we prepare to leave this place and go back out into the world, each one of us, an ambassador for human rights, peace, and justice in the world, I invite you to join me in the responsive sending forth in your bulletins. May I become at all times, both now and forever, a protector for those without protection, a guide for those who have lost their way, a ship for those with oceans to cross, a bridge for those with rivers to cross, an island for those who are drowning, a sanctuary for those in danger, a great medicine for the sick, a lamp for those without light, a bed for those who need rest, a place of refuge for those who lack shelter, and a servant to all in need. And until we pass away from pain, may I be a source of abundance, life, and harmony for all sentient beings, all the earth, a vehicle for bliss until the ends of the universe. You're once again invited to stand as you're able as we join and sing together the refrain of the World Peace Prayer.
Representative Carson, uh, thank you for uh, gifting us, really gracing us uh, with your presence tonight and your challenge, your inspiration, and for representing uh, civil rights, human rights, uh, uh, political rights, uh, uh, representing us, uh, uh, progressive voice in U.S. Congress. Please join us in the Folsom Fellowship Hall for light refreshments and fellowship, and thank you all for being with us tonight. <laughs>